OK, so probably it's time that we start. Uh, so let me welcome everyone to this uh, uh, IEEE uh, IES Industrial Electronics Society's WA chapter webinar. This is the second webinar that we are doing this year. And uh, this webinar is uh, on the area of wide area monitoring and control for power systems using uh, phaser measurement units or PMUs. Uh, my name is uh, Farhad Shahnia. I am an associate professor at Murdoch University. Uh, I was the, uh, I'm the immediate past chair of the IESWA chapter, and this year I'm the secretary of this uh, chapter. Uh, today we are honored to have Dr. Lasanta Migahapola among us. Uh, as the beginning, I'll just uh, read very briefly uh, a summary of Dr. Uh, of uh, Dr. Migahapola's uh, CV. So uh, Lasanta has received his PhD from Queen's University of Belfast in UK in 2010, uh, and during his uh, doctoral studies, he was working on uh, the power system stability issues uh, of uh, networks with high wind uh, penetration. And that research was conducted in collaboration with uh, the uh, Ireland's uh, transmission system operator, AirGrid. Uh, uh, Dr. Migapola has over 13 years of research experience in the areas of power system dynamics and stability, especially those networks with high renewable power generations, and so far has published over 100 uh, scholarly journal and conference articles. Uh, he has also worked in the areas of microgrid dynamics and stability and coordinated reactive power dispatch uh, in steady state and dynamic and transient conditions for networks with high wind penetration. Uh, after his PhD, uh, La Santa was a visiting researcher in the Electricity Research Center of University of College Dublin in Ireland uh, in 2009 and 10. Uh, from 2011, uh, he, he has moved to Australia and uh, for four years he was an a lecturer at University of Wollongong in the East Coast. Uh, right now he's a senior lecturer at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT in Melbourne. Uh, Dr. Lasante is a senior member of IEEE and a member of IEEE's PES and IES societies. Uh, he's also uh, a, a, an editor in two very prestigious journals of uh, IEEE and IET. So uh, that was a very brief summary of uh, Dr. Migapola's CV. So, uh, La Santa, I leave the rest of the time for you. So please go ahead uh, through the presentations. And then at the end, yes. I'll come back and we'll try to have some question and answer sessions at the end from the audience. So thanks very much. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Fahad. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. <laughs> and I'm La Santa. Uh, let me start with the, some brief introductory slides in my presentation. So here you could see some uh, a blackout city. Uh, this is in fact uh, far away 1965, uh, which is usually known as the Great Northeast Blackout, which happened in the USA and Canada. And actually this event was occurred in uh, due to that enormous uh, value set in certain protection equipment. And then uh, the power system engineers and power system operators start to think of ways of tackling these problems because at that time they didn't had a proper monitoring system across the power systems. So that is how the supervisory control and data acquisition systems came. So the SCADA, which is uh, commonly named, called as SCADA, SCADA systems in fact uh, emerge as the one of the things to tackle and monitor the power system stability and uh, dynamics. So then uh, after a while the system was operating perfectly and the system was uh, in fact uh, up to a certain level uh, stressed out as well. And then uh, another blackout came in 2003. So this is the most famous blackout which features thousands of research activities across US as well as in the globe. So more than 50 million people were affected, 63 gigawatt of load was interrupted, and there were a lot of uh, different types of faults happened, and uh, end of the day, power system operator couldn't able to tackle these issues. And as a result of the investigation carried out in this particular blackout, uh, 
uh, one of the major things emerged was uh, the lack of real-time monitoring. Yes, of course, uh, the system operator has SCADA data, but SCADA doesn't uh, ensure uh, the real-time monitoring of the network. So many people start to think of ways of analyzing the network and monitor the network in real time. So as a result, the powers, uh, the phase measurement unit technology uh, came into the picture. So the phase measurement unit technology was there, in fact, uh, for since 1980s. And uh, until this blackout, nobody really cares of using this technology for the real time stability monitoring and control. So this is one of the key events that happened in the last two decades, which has triggered the importance of the uh, real-time monitoring of the power network. And uh, again, uh, when it comes to the Australian context, in 2016, uh, South Australian blackout came as well, but actually it happened due to a, some, uh, something else. It's happened due to an incorrect setting in the wind farms and so many other uh, issues. But uh, in the report also, it mentioned about uh, the real-time monitoring uh, aspects related to the power system. So especially uh, when it comes to the frequency monitoring, the reports highlight uh, the precise frequency monitoring at different points of the network. So also, end of the day, the importance of uh, wide area monitoring uh, based on the real time data was highlighted. So having said this, my pitch. So today's my presentation is on wide area monitoring and control of power systems using phase measurement unit technology. So uh, in today's presentation, I'm going to cover these sort of uh, topics. First, I will introduce you to the basic structure of the phase measurement unit technology. And then uh, I will briefly discuss about the key design factors. And then after that, uh, we have developed a PMU model, which can be used for simulations. And in fact, it is an improved model of the, uh, the basic model given in the standard. And then uh, I will show you some performance comparison with the different types of PMU models. After that, uh, I'm going to show a case study related to the real-time voltage stability analysis. So this is the basic outline of my today's presentation. So uh, having said that, so let's look at uh, the general power system. So this is how the power system will definitely look like. A brief uh, picture. So usually what we do is uh, when it comes to the phase measurement units uh, we install them at uh, power stations as well as substations so most importantly uh, installing at the substations are really important uh, compared even with the power stations because substations are the ones which feed in the loads as well as aggregating the generation from uh, from other side so what we do is uh, under this phase measurement technology we go and install a phase measurement unit. So here I just showed you some uh, brief uh, structure of the phase measurement unit. So the phase measurement unit, uh, in fact, uh, usually have six channels, three for the voltages and three for current. So when it comes to the usually for voltage stability or power system stability monitoring, we always use the three channels, the voltage channels, and it will go through internal signal conditioning unit and then the ADC. And the most important aspect is uh, the GPS time stamping, because uh, when it comes to the SCADA system, the problem is accurate time stamping because uh, in the SCADA system, the data is captured uh, instantaneously and uh, time stamp according to the local clock. But with the phase measurement unit technology, we can time stamp the data according to a one single uh, clock, which is coming from the GPS satellite systems. And then uh, we process it and uh, extract the phaser. And after we extract the phaser, we can derive the frequency as well as the rate of frequency from that point. And uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, this technology, so these are the main uh, parameters we usually uh, measure. So. First thing is the positive sequence voltage phaser when it comes to the uh, volt stability monitoring because there are some technology being developed uh, uh, which is used for the uh, power quality monitoring. 
So when it comes to the power quality monitoring, you can extract the uh, harmonic components as well. But what we here really interested is uh, extracting the, the positive sequence voltage phaser, which is more important when it comes to the voltage stability monitoring. So we extract the positive sequence voltage phaser, and uh, through that uh, we can calculate the system frequency as well, taking the time derivative of the theta, and also we calculate the rate of change of frequency. So the most important thing is uh, once we extract this data, uh, it will get timestamped internally and send it through this communication channel to a one location. So if you look at a system, which uh, uh, in fact, when it comes to the stability monitoring, what we are really interested in is uh, the positive sequence voltage phase and frequency stability monitoring, we are interested on the system frequency and the rate of change of frequency. So the other fact is, uh, since we extracting these parameters, the frequency stability monitoring parameters, which are the system frequency as well as the rate of change of frequency, those are extracted from the initial derived phase estimation. So if something happens, this synchronous phase estimation process, if some error happen at that process, then probably uh, that particular error get uh, magnified at the system frequency as well as the rate of change of frequency estimation process. So that's why it is important to uh, uh, tackle this uh, error issues at the synchrophase estimation process itself, otherwise the errors get, get magnified. So if you look at uh, how we can uh, use this technology across a large network, here I have shown a test system. So what we do is usually we identify a specific locations in the network. So there are ways of identifying the specific uh, critical nodes of the network. Either you can uh, run uh, typical stability simulations, or you can run uh, some other integer programming based algorithm and identify the critical nodes or the critical substations. And those substations, we install the PMU units, and then those will get, uh, those uh, PMUs will uh, communicate to a central location. So usually we call it as the phase of data concentrator, uh, PDC. So the PDCs will accumulate all the PMU data and synchronize them uh, and then uh, you can develop various different algorithm to monitor the uh, system stability. So this this uh, PDC part as well as the data visualization part usually happens at the uh, system operator level. And also uh, the other important thing is we can store this data as well and uh, the one of the important aspects of the storage of this data is uh, uh, after your this get stored, you can run uh, various different uh, data analytics algorithm to capture other uh, aspects of the network. So these are not real time aspects, like if you have uh, some sort of oscillations present in the network, you can analyze this data and obtain uh, different information relating to system oscillations. So there are a lot of, uh, in fact, advantages uh, of using the PMU technology for accurate uh, stability monitoring as well as control. So nowadays, in fact, uh, the most of the time, uh, rather than visualizing and analyzing the data in the real time, even these uh, data being used for the control purposes as well. So uh, for an example, uh, you can develop the algorithms uh, to control various devices at real time to tackle the system oscill oscillations. So let's look at what are the key design factors are when it comes to the PMUs, because as I have shown you earlier, uh, the synchrophase estimation algorithm itself playing a key role here, because uh, there is two distinct uh, silos here. One is the signal processing uh, researchers, they were looking at optimizing this algorithm. Uh, that means phase estimation algorithm. And then from the other side, power system researchers mainly looking at how to use this phase estimation for real time stability monitoring. But uh, since most of the cases, since uh, these two researchers are not really talking with each other, there could be some uh, discrepancy between uh, the full understanding of this technology for the betterment of 
uh, use of stability monitoring. So that's why, in fact, uh, we have been researching on the algorithm side developments as well as the stability side developments. So if you look at the key design factors, so those factors are remaining relating to these uh, signal processing part. There are three key elements. So the first three element is the time alignment. So the time alignment is uh, from the point at which you acquire the data and at the same time point you have to properly timestamp that data. And the other factor is immunity to noise. So in this factor, uh, we are talking about in fact uh, harmonics as well as other distortion components present in the network. So obviously uh, the networks are always prone to the uh, different types of distortions. So if you want to get a proper signal out from the model, then probably you have to write a algorithm uh, which can isolate the fundamental frequency. So the uh, the adverse effect of doing such a thing is uh, it will really slow the uh, processing process. And then it will uh, at end of the day affect the reporting latency because the latency also is an important factor because if you run in a more complex algorithm, that means definitely uh, you have to co make a compromise on the reporting latencies. So, and also it will affect the time alignment as well. So again, if you want to have achieve an uh, higher reporting, uh, lower reporting latency, then probably you have to uh, run a much less complicated algorithm. So that's why there is an always a trade-off between these three elements to get a proper algorithm running in your PMU. And the other fact is usually the PMUs are supplied by the various different manufacturers. So most of the manufacturers run in the DFT or distributed Fourier transform based algorithms. And even uh, the power system utilities doesn't know what is inside it. But the real fact is uh, different algorithms could lead to uh, different stability outcomes. So that is why uh, we have primarily conducted uh, a study on different types of algorithms and see, uh, analyzed uh, what sort of effect it could have end of the day for the voltage stability monitoring as well as the frequency stability monitoring. So, uh, so what we did was in fact, uh, primarily we want to achieve uh, three, uh, uh, I think the trade-off between these three factors, which are the time alignment, immunity to noise as well as the reported latencies. So what we did was we took the standard model given in uh, IEEE standard C37118. Now it has been superseded to IEC IEEE 6225118 uh, and uh, developed an improved model. So the basis of uh, improving that model was to isolate the fundamental component and then uh, properly capture the fundamental phaser. So if you take an input signal like this, uh, which is comprised of the main fundamental frequency as well as harmonic as well as uh, some interference component, it can be represented in this manner, which is uh, XT is equal to XMT cos 2F uh, fundamental frequency into T phi and the harmonic component as well as the OBIO uh, out of band interference component. So in uh, in uh, usual in the frequency domain, we can represent these component in this way. So our objective is to isolate this, uh, the blue color, the input fundamental and uh, reject the rest of the components. So uh, in fact, uh, when it comes to the frequency range, we have looked at the frequency range between uh, plus or minus two Hertz, because uh, when it comes to the uh, power system, if you go below that value of 48 or 52, probably it is it is a uh, system where that you can't really recover. So in within that boundary, you need to maintain a high accuracy when it comes to the frequency or the phase estimation. And then uh, the harmonic components presence as well as various different uh, uh, out of band interference component present. So our principle, uh, in fact, based on the quadrature demodulation technique, what it does is it multiply the input signal by the complex fundamental component. And uh, beauty of this process is, in fact, uh, which is the QD technique is, uh, you can uh, take 
uh, once you process this way, that means input uh, component with a complex fundamental, you can get obtain a frequency difference component as well as frequency addition component. And when you uh, represent them it in this particular format, you could now clearly see the input component uh, will get, uh, which is the fundamental component, get uh, properly isolated from the rest of the component so that you can easily uh, derive and uh, uh, in fact uh, extract the fundamental component. So that is the basic of the QD technique, the fundamentals of the QD technique, but you need to achieve, to achieve this, you need to have a number of filtering stages as well as the filter order should also be optimized to uh, reduce the reporting latency. So in fact, what we did was we got that model and then uh, we have uh, introduced the new uh, components. So here you could see in this particular diagram, the blue, uh, the green color ones are the ones which usually exist in this uh, standard QD algorithm. And uh, what we have proposed was the ones which are shown in the orange color. So what we did was we initially uh, had an uh, developer special low pass filter at the front and then uh, we optimized the ADC component and the digital converter com uh, components and then uh, we run the quadrature demodulation technique. After that uh, we have defined uh, different uh, uh, filters. Uh, one is for the M type, other one for the uh, protection type uh, PMUs. And after that, uh, we do the uh, the rest of the processing. So with this particular algorithm, we could able to uh, come up with some sort of uh, trade-off between the three design factors, which are the noise immunity. Uh, that is where that we can isolate the harmonic interference of the harmonic components, as well as the interharmonic components as well as we can obtain improved uh, reporting latency and obtain a proper time alignment. So then what we did was in fact, uh, we uh, took uh, consider uh, three other, two other algorithms as well as then we benchmark it. So when it comes to the benchmarking or the performance comparison, uh, uh, the main measure is called the total vector error total vector error. So the total vector error is, uh, is a quantity which measured uh, the difference between the actual as well as the measured phaser. So here in this particular diagram, uh, you could see uh, uh, in dark blue color, that is the actual phaser. And around it, uh, we can define a circle which shows you the allowable range that act the measured phaser can vary. So the light blue color, the light blue color one, in fact, uh, the one which is shown here is the actual measured one from your phaser measurement unit, and it can vary between uh, this range because uh, usually the total vector error allowed in the standard is uh, 1%. So you can have 1% uh, total vector error. Uh, with respect to the actual phaser. And if it is going out from that, that, that means your phaser measurement unit is uh, not complying to the standard. So uh, this is the main measure. And uh, using this particular measure, uh, we have compared three algorithms. One is the uh, phaser lock loop technique, and uh, which is very commonly being used in the uh, power electronic devices, as well as some um, phase measurement uh, devices also use uh, PLL technique. And then our quadrature demodulation technique, the enhanced version. And after that, uh, the discrete Fourier transform technique, which is commonly used in the uh, uh, commercial PMUs. And then uh, what we did was uh, we ran few tests given in the IEEE uh, IEC 6255 standard. There are a range of tests uh, and see, uh, observe what these algorithms are doing. So here in this particular diagram, in fact, uh, this particular graph, it shows you uh, how the performance uh, looks like for these three algorithms. So the red color one, which shows you the uh, PLL, 
and the blue color one shows the DFT and the QD is showing uh, the improved version that we developed. So in fact, uh, you could see when uh, the harmonic numbers uh, going higher, still uh, the PLL performing good, but it, its performance is uh, worse than the DFT as well as QD technique. But the good thing is all three algorithms uh, conform into the standard because uh, the total vector error is still less than 1% because even uh, you could see the harmonic numbers are uh, at this range, uh, the lower range, uh, the PLL performance is degrading, but uh, throughout the range given in the standard up to the 50th harmonic, still the total vector error is less than 1%. And uh, and the other test, uh, I will show you another test result. Again, uh, we did the static frequency offset test. So that means uh, the input uh, fundamental, we vary from uh, 50 to 52 from the upper side, as well as we change it from 50 to 48. And you could see the PLL technique is in fact uh, doing better across all. And the DFT technique is in fact uh, moving across uh, the range. So it, it's, uh, its accuracy is varying, uh, the simply because uh, DFT is tuned for 50 Hertz. And soon after you deviate from the 50 Hertz, uh, its accuracy degrades simply because the number of samples get reduced. So, uh, so therefore uh, the DFT accuracy is uh, particularly less when the 50 hertz, uh, the fundamental moves away. So uh, that's the important observation as well because uh, most of the commercial ones are developed according to this technique. So it shows uh, the things could got worse when you have the DFT technique as the uh, phase measurement technique. So uh, there are some other tests as well. I haven't shown you here, but uh, the ultimate conclusion here is uh, Yes, all three algorithms, uh, which is the Quaritch demodulation technique, which we developed, uh, enhanced, and the DFT technique, which is used in the many of the commercial PMUs as well as the PLL techniques, they all conform into the uh, the IEEE standard, uh, which is uh, the total vector is less than one percent because in all these two tests, you could see the total vector is 1%. So that means uh, whatever the PMU is going to the market is in fact uh, performing well according to the standard. But still, you could see some discrepancies happening between all three algorithms. So let's uh, look at how these, uh, as these uh, uh, algorithms actually going to perform when you put into the field. So that's why we need to have three different sets of uh, PMUs. One is uh, based on the PLL and the another one is based on DFT. Other PMU type is based on the quadrature demodulation. So if you go and install these PMUs in the field and then we run a voltage, real time voltage stability algorithm, you could you need to see what sort of effects it could have. So then what we did was after this performance comparison, yes, it's all good and they all confirm into the standard. Let's go and work out the real-time voltage stability analysis. So when it comes to the real-time voltage stability analysis, there are various different techniques being used. Uh, one technique is in fact uh, the Lapinov exponent technique, uh, which calculate the Lapinov exponent and track that exponent throughout the time duration. And if uh, the Lapinov exponent exceed zero and go into the positive region uh, or the exponent become positive, then it is uh, flagging as an instability condition. So this is in fact an algorithm that uh, we have used uh, for this one. So what we did was we installed the PMUs and uh, feed uh, PMU data into this particular algorithm. And then uh, we obtain the highest Lapinov exponent through this way. And again, uh, we have uh, improved uh, the standard uh, Lapinov exponent algorithm, uh, which is uh, given in this particular formula. Uh, 
uh, one discrepancy that we found in the standard algorithm was this initial condition defined here. So this DJ zero is in fact the initial voltage difference between two adjacent samples. And uh, that is in the denominator and that is compared with every uh, sample coming into the uh, uh, feeding uh, into the voltage stability algorithm. So if uh, this DJ component is uh, greater than this one, then it will trigger as an instability condition. But the problem is this initial uh, denominator component because it could trigger some false alarms. So what we did was uh, instead of getting that one, we have defined uh, a separate uh, DJ component based on the actual fault signature so that it won't give you any fault uh, false alarm even under oscillatory conditions. Because uh, when you feed in uh, uh, the PMU data, the voltage data samples into this algorithm, if there is an oscillation in this uh, frequency of the voltage waveform, uh, then probably what would happen is it could trigger a false alarm in the uh, in the voltage stability algorithm and flag it as an instability condition. So uh, also uh, there could be a situation where that it won't really detect an uh, actual voltage stability issue. So so there, therefore we have modified this denominator to reflect the actual fault condition and then that will get uh, put it as a denominator and compare uh, take the ratio of the actual voltage difference component. So here we can uh, show you how it works. So here uh, in the left hand side you could see a voltage waveform uh, and it at one point it is uh, falling to 0.7. So the 0.7 is kind of a voltage which can be considered as a point at which uh, the system voltage is uh, severely uh, dropped or it could lead to instability. So that should be properly flagged. And under standard algorithm, it won't flag as an error uh, or instability condition. But here in the modified algorithm, it is flagging as an uh, instability condition simply because the Laponov exponent going above zero and it becomes uh, positive. And uh, that is the out uh, improvement that we make when it comes to the real time voltage stability algorithm. Because everything uh, should be in the perfect shape in, in order to uh, benchmark three different types of uh, PMU types. And then what we did was we used the standard IEEE 39 bus system and uh, we ran an algorithm uh, to identify the critical nodes. So the because we we can't uh, in fact it is not feasible to install uh, PMUs on all 39 bus bars because it is not a feasible way of uh, measuring the real time stability of the network. We have to always find out the optimal locations. So we have to identify the optimal locations by a particular techno way. So there are techniques to do that. Uh, so we have used integer programming method to identify the critical nodes. So we end up with uh, 13 critical nodes and all 13 th critical nodes we go and install these PMUs, PMU models that we developed earlier. And uh, then what we did was as the first study, all 13 PMUs had the uh, EPLL algorithm, enhanced PLL algorithm. And then uh, the next time we replace all 13 with the PMUs having the DFD algorithm. And then finally we replace all 13 PMUs with the QRHA demodulation algorithm. And all three conditions, uh, all with all three types of PMUs, we have uh, considered range of faults. And then observe how this Laponov exponent which is the main determinant of the voltage stability going to vary and uh, how each and uh, every types of EMU going to respond or going to flag the instability condition. So here in the next slide, uh, you could see uh, a fault happening uh, in the line uh, four connective 
the line connecting bus bar 4 and bus bar 14 in the New England 39 system. And uh, it is of uh, 140 millisecond fault. Uh, so you could see this bus bar voltage severely drops. And then uh, we tested different algorithm as you mentioned, uh, or the PMUs which have in different algorithms. So you could see the EPLL method is here and the Quaraja demodulation method is here. So both are tracking uh, the exponent in a similar way, but when you have the DFT, it is tracking the exponent in a different way uh, compared to the other two. But still, since it is not an instability conditions because the bus voltages are recovering back after the fault, none of these algorithms are uh, giving any uh, false alarms. So that is a good outcome. But uh, then what we did was uh, we want to simulate a real instability scenario. So what we did was we drop one of the generation sources, which is uh, bus 39 generator. So if you are really familiar with the IEEE 39 bus system, the, the biggest generator is installed at bus 39. So we drop it for uh, 625 milliseconds and let uh, the voltages and everything to oscillate and observe uh, what these three types of PMU is going to do. So surprisingly, uh, when we uh, look at these three methods, all three methods trigger the stability condition at different time frames. At different time frame, even in the worst case, uh, DFT algorithm recorded 120 milliseconds after uh, the PLL and QD methods. So 120 milliseconds is uh, quite a long time duration when it comes to the stability, even when it comes to the transient stability, the first swing stability is a quite a big uh, a duration, but uh, for example, it's like a six cycles. So, so that sort of uh, difference you could see when you have uh, a uh, different type of PMU installed in your uh, uh, network. So, uh, and the surprisingly, the DFT is the algorithm that been used by ma many commercial manufacturers as well. So uh, that, in fact, uh, is kind of a uh, kind of a uh, uh, important point. In fact, because uh, if uh, this could be measured 120 millisecond earlier, uh, certain automatic control systems could uh, kick in and avert the uh, or trigger uh, some sort of protection mechanisms. So uh, these could, things could happen if you have different algorithms in the network because uh, uh, power system uh, operators, they couldn't procure different uh, PMUs from different manufacturers. And uh, manufacturers, in fact, try to develop the PMUs according to the IEEE standards and they all conform into the standard, but when it comes to the stability analysis, even the small difference could magnify to give an, um, an false alarm or uh, it could trigger the instability conditions after a certain uh, significant uh, time error. So uh, that is in fact the major conclusion we made through this uh, particular study. Uh, and uh, as a conclusion, uh, what we did was uh, the fees we analyzed the feasibility of synchrophaser technology and of course it's a viable technology for real-time stability assessments and uh, PMU synchrophaser estimation algorithms should be carefully designed considering the trade-off between different key design factors so which are noise immunity time alignment and reporting latency each factor is interrelated with each other if you try to improve one factor for example noise immunity then probably it could uh, affect the other parameters. So these uh, key uh, aspects need to be considered when it comes to synchrophase technology, a synchronous estimation algorithm development. And, uh, and the other conclusion we made from the uh, comparison studies, uh, all the algorithms are actually conforming to the more or less conforming to the IEEE standard. But when it comes to the uh, real-time stability uh, measurement, the slightest errors that uh, could result between different algorithms could get magnified and they could give false alarms or delayed responses. 
So that is in fact an important consideration. So probably in future, maybe uh, uh, it is important to uh, test the PMUs according to the stability part as well, because the current standards are not really talking about uh, those aspects. They are mostly talking about the signal processing part, not on the the usage side of these uh, PMUs. So that is the major conclusions that we made. And uh, of course, uh, for a betterment of the uh, network as well as the monitoring, uh, uh, these SCADA systems actually should supersede it from this technology, the phase measurement technology. In fact, many countries across the world is installing uh, heaps of uh, PMUs across their network uh, in Europe as well as in China and India. They all install in the PMUs and he also uh, receiving a lot of attention of uh, getting the PMUs installed and replace the existing CADA systems. So uh, that is in fact uh, the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, La Santa, for the very uh, nice and detailed presentation about the PMUs and uh, the existing and uh, already, I mean, the algorithms that are being already used and the proposals which you have had and in order to improve their uh, performance. That was very informative. I really myself enjoyed that in like that introductory uh, slides, which is showing the importance of the real-time control of the power systems as well. Uh, so now uh, I'm just opening the uh, uh, platform for everyone to ask questions. So yeah, please uh, feel free to go ahead and ask your questions. So, so probably let me, I'll, I'll be the person that I'm starting the questions. Um, throughout your uh, presentation, you were mainly uh, talking about three key techniques, which uh, my understanding is that the discrete wavelet transform is sort of uh, like outperforming against the others. Is that correct? Uh Yes, uh, that is what we found out. Even uh, we have used an improved version of the DFT technique, uh, which is uh, which is having uh, some uh, windowing technique to improve its uh, boundary stability condition. But still, it's uh, it's in fact the technique uh, which gives you the bit of inferior performance. And uh, these these are not only the techniques. So there are some more, more techniques as well. The the main reason that we picked up the DFT was. Uh, uh, that is the technique being used in many of the commercial manufacturers. But uh, they are, of course, they haven't, uh, in fact, uh, disclosed what their algorithm is, but they are reporting they're using the DFT technique. And also, of course, there are some other techniques as well. And then uh, we select the PLL because the inverters uh, commonly use the PLL techniques. So we use the enhanced PLL technique uh, for the comparison. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, any other questions from the your audience? Hi, Prof. May I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, the, this is Matthew speaking. I'm from Malaysia. Then, uh, first of all, thank you for, for your detailed uh, lecture on the uh, wide area monitoring. Actually, the question I have here is that uh, I saw that you you compare three different methods to to detect your fault as soon as possible to avoid any, any consequence of, of like like uh, maybe maybe I don't know total shutdown or or like like the disaster into the system. My question is that in which situation in which situation you will you will lead to a late detection. And what are the main causes to have a late detection? I saw that you are concerned about the the harmonics on the voltage and current, and you are going to filter the noise on the voltage and current. Yes. What other factors are are actually affecting the the latency of your detection? 
So the main factor is the uh, actual uh, the algorithms that you are running on it because uh, usually if you want to get a proper output or proper phase estimation, uh, you can have a higher filter order. Uh, so obviously the higher filter order will uh, improve the accuracy at the, from the other end when you have a higher filter order, then probably it will reduce the, uh, the calculation speed of the algorithm. Right. So right. yes, so it's yeah. kind of a big trade-off because if you try to get rid of a lot of uh, unwanted components like harmonic, interharmonics, uh, OBIs, and everything, you can write a perfect algorithm, but the uh, the cost is your their latency, the processing latency that you have. Yeah. At the same yes. time, then you have to get the timestamp right to the sample point at which you acquired it. So that 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 is the real game here. So. Getting the perfect algorithm in this case is really difficult, uh, but the things are really improving now because even the phase measurement technology has improved into the micro phases, which even having a higher accuracy as well as higher speeds. So you mean you mean even if the, the accuracy is below uh, is above 99 percent, they are still slow to detect the failure into the system. Am I right? Yes. Ah, because ah. these things could be multiplied because uh, uh, it will have uh, some. Uh, of course, uh, once you measure the voltage and uh, calculate the phaser, it has to be communicated into the, uh, the the system operator point. So that means uh, even you can use the fiber optic. At these days, we use the fiber optic to transmit uh, this data. But still, there is some sort of transmission latency as well accumulated into these things. Right, right, right. So the lump effect, the lump effect will cause a very large delay into our detection process. So yes. what? Yeah, the my my ultimate question is like, maybe for the current grid, we have plenty of power electronics converted into the grid, and yes. their behavior is quite different from the conventional just transformers and the generators into the grid. So I, I want to say. The response of the grid to the fail to the fault might be even different. I mean, the characteristic of the response might be even different once we have a lot of power electronics into the system. Do you think the impact of power electronics should be taken into consideration once we want to once we want to analyze a even 39 baht system? Uh, Probably you are right, uh, but uh, in this particular research, we didn't in fact consider any of the other types of uh, generating sources uh, because our ultimate objective is to identify uh, the discrepancies which could happen because of different types of algorithms. But of course, your point is exactly right because uh, when you have the electronic based sources, probably you definitely have to have more uh, uh, components built into your algorithm phase measurement algorithm to remove the unwanted components, especially the high frequency harmonics coming into the system. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you Thank for you your very answer. Much. I think that, that, that's all for me. Thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Lassan. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, that uh, what is the future research direct directions in this area and uh, so far which countries have used the PMUs? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm working with some of the colleagues. So obviously the US is heading towards the PMU direction because uh, th that is the place where that they started this whole revolution because in 1986 or 87 year, yeah, that's the year, uh, year that this technology was uh, developed first but nobody really cares until 2003 blackout and that real blackout in fact triggers a lot of research in us and across the globe and this technology came into the picture and then uh, the nowadays uh, i know that uh, norway uh, the scandinavia also investing a lot of money into the pmu technology i believe the other european nations also uh, you know put in a lot of uh, money and then uh, china also investing a lot of money uh, put in the PMUs and a uh, few years back I heard the uh, India also installing they already got 5000 PMUs in their network that time maybe a few six five six years earlier but 
but I know that here also uh, in Australia, also some substations, uh, they got the PMUs, but there is no uh, proper um, um, real-time monitoring measurement system across the whole name based on the PMUs, uh, which it would be very beneficial to have in future. I know that in Queensland also, uh, the power link, they got the PMUs and uh, they are running some in-house uh, algorithms. So uh, there is no wide scale adaptation, but other countries, they are adopting it over the SCADA systems. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Moyed Mokwell from APD Engineer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, one point, uh, the future research direction, even now, uh, the things are even coming to the distribution side as well. So in the distribution side, the phase angles are pretty much small. So that means uh, you have to have a high accuracy as well. So therefore, uh, some US researchers in California, Berkeley, they develop a technology called microsynchrophases. So the main, uh, the term they use microsynchrophases means they can, uh, in fact, uh, capture very, very, uh, accurate phase angle differences in the distribution network levels. So that is an emerging uh, area of research. And that technology, uh, there's a company who's be, uh, be, uh, you know, developing these microsynchrophase units. Uh, it's it's have higher accuracy and even they claim to have 100 times better accuracy than standard phase measurement units installed in the transmission grid. Prof, uh, sorry. It is Matthew again. I have one more question just now came to my mind. Uh, out of the all the components in the system, which you told us that they will cause a latency to our detection, which components are making the most delay into the system? Is it filters? Is it GPS communication? Or is it some mathematical calculations? Which one is at the moment causing the big, big share? Uh, the mainly the phase estimation component, which is uh, including the filters and everything. Ah, ah, ah. So can I say it's mainly to the mathematical calculation because phaser yes. is. Yeah, mathematical process. Yes. Yeah. What, what processor is is widely being used at the moment? Is it FPGA or are there? Yeah, FPGA is the technology being used. Ah, ah, ah. But it still is slow. Still, uh, it's slow because uh, because you had to get rid of a lot of uh, harmonic components into it. Because uh, the thing is this, uh, whatever the PMU they develop, the manufacturers develop, it should conform to the standard and the standard specifies a range of tests and they want to test under even with the 50th harmonics. And uh, one thing was when they first draft this IEEE C37118 standard, they have put a lot of rigorous uh, testing measures into it. And uh, later uh, in 2014, they amended the standard uh, to allow some relaxation into it because manufacturers complained they couldn't able to come into the, such a great accuracy. So I think that is the main uh, main hurdle at this point. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, hello. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Lasanta. I'm Amin Mahmoudi from uh, Flinders University. Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the latency. Uh, you mentioned that the latency is basically sensitive to phase or estimation uh, when you are estimating the phase or basically. I want to know how sensitive are different PMUs uh, when estimating. In fact, I want to know uh, how many cycles are we talking about and how your proposed uh, algorithm uh, has been improved from that aspect. Uh... I could give you one answer. That means uh, even in our test, it has shown you, in fact, six cycle latency. In a certain case, I have shown you here. Uh, so that is from the measuring point. Uh, 
towards the real time voltage stability analysis point. But there could be latencies, in fact, go up to four to five cycles as well. But uh, the algorithms that we got, which is the improved quarish demodulation technique, uh, it could handle even half a cycle to one cycle. Thank you. That's very impressive. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoudi. By the way, Dr. Mahmoudi was our last speaker, so thanks very much for your last month's talk as well. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, can I have a second question as well? And uh, how do you see the future of PMUs in Australia, either in transmission network or distribution network? Uh, you said that we, we, we had, they have started having them in Australia as well, but uh, how do you think that it is going to be preceded? Do you think it was sort of uh, just one step and then uh, that stopped or there will be further installations across the transmission network and they are going to uh, towards that micro uh, PMU level at the distribution networks as well? Uh, I I think uh, the thing is this, uh, Fahad, I mean, so that's a very important question, a very good question, because at this point, individual transmission system operators, operators are embracing this technology. For example, I think the power link in Queensland, they are in the top of the game. They got the PMUs running, you know, that Reza and uh, his team, even uh, yes, some yeah, people yeah. did. So they were, they were really on top of the game. But other than them, I haven't seen wide scale adaptation. Even I know that some of the Victorian utilities, they got here PMUs here and there, but they are not really, really proactive on it. Even uh, when it comes to the, uh, the 2016 uh, uh, South Australian blackout report, uh, they highlighted some issues in their measurement systems. One is the accurate uh, estimation of the frequency because uh, they were not really satisfied the frequencies they captured during this particular blackout is correct. And then uh, the people turn out and say, uh, why not you use the PMUs to get these data more accurately? So I think uh, to, uh, to, to get this technology, why you want to adopt this technology in a wide scale in the name, Australian name, I think there should be a policy directive or something should come from the uh, the regulator. Uh, it could be AEMO or AMC, AEMC, because those are the authorities which uh, run in the rule book here in this country. So if, and as long as they don't, don't do something, uh, this technology will be like an Technology which is isolatedly, you know, used by the TNSPs or so the transmission system operators. So we won't see any wide-scale adaptation until they put up uh, a name rule saying that you have to measure their frequencies, voltage up to this accuracy, and the rule whatever in the name. So unless it happens, uh, I don't see any wide-scale adaptation. But uh, mm -hmm. distribution side, I uh, I believe uh, somehow the micro synchrophaser technology will get used in the next five to ten years maybe because it's come in a very very uh, popular area now in us right right uh, that's very great thank you thanks thank you for uh, any other questions last chance <laughs> <laughs> uh, no more questions mm -hmm. but i have one question Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. La Santa, for your very interesting presentation. I'm okay. Amir from Merdak University. And uh, you mentioned to the uh, role of uh, big data and analytics and uh, this technology, I mean the AI technology and in the beginning of your presentation. Yes, yes. Is there any realistic, uh, you know, example currently exists, uh, you know, uh, outside that using this technology associated with the PM, PMU you mentioned, uh, especially I mean, in Australia. Uh, Australia, to be honest, there I can't really find uh, anything uh, because I am personally trying to get into that space as well. Because uh, if you have seen a lot of research papers uh, coming from uh, transaction of power systems and other particular journals, a lot of things are now being happening there. So what they do is uh, because uh, 
the utilities have this data and they're stored in their the computers. Now the researchers are using this stored data. It's not about the real time. It's they use this stored data and analyze them and uh, capture various different trends like the oscillations. Uh, so then uh, they could able to do a lot of studies relating to improving that uh, dynamic stability. So the data analytics area is emerging and it's happening uh, in fact uh, in wide scale in utility scale as well outside Australia. In, uh, particularly in the US and even in Canada, I would say. Oh, yeah, nice. because uh, th these are not like, uh, these are hundreds of terabytes of data. Yeah, so you, yeah. unless otherwise you run a proper data analytics algorithm on it, you can't really see it because you can't really monitor or this uh, thousands of data unless you run a proper algorithm on it. So it is happening. It's another area as well, emerging area. But uh, mm -hmm. to be honest, uh, I might be incorrect, uh, but I haven't seen uh, any specific things, uh, but maybe somebody's maybe isolated doing, but I haven't seen honestly here. All right, all right. Thank you very much. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. So uh, it, it's already past six o'clock, so uh, <laughs> I hope I, I hope there is no more questions left, right? Uh, okay, yeah, fantastic. So thanks very much, uh, La Santa, for the very good uh, and detailed and very informative presentation on the topic of PMUs and uh, their application in power systems. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody enjoyed the talk and it was very informative, very uh, detailed. So thanks very much for that. Uh, and it was very You're good welcome. that we had Thank you. And it was very good that today among us we had uh, two members outside WA, uh, outside Western Australia. So we had Dr. Amin Mahmoudi and uh, Mahdi uh, Tusizadeh from uh, Adelaide and from uh, Malaysia. So thanks very much for being with us as well as the other members from uh, Western Australia. So that was very great. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, uh, the IEEE uh, IESWA chapter has decided that uh, we uh, try to invite at least one speaker every month uh, and arrange a, like a webinar once every month. So uh, if you know any, if you are interested yourself in giving a talk or if you know any colleagues that you think uh, the audience will like the talk, uh, please definitely get in contact with uh, either with me or uh, with one of the like uh, colleagues in uh, I, IEEE or IES and uh, I'll be I mean we'll be happy definitely to invite you or the nominated colleague to give a talk uh, in this platform. So thanks very much all. Uh, hope you had enjoyed the talk. Thanks very much uh, Dr. Lasanta for the great presentation and that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Fahad for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.